When I started putting this video together, I had a very different idea of how it was going to turn out. I initially intended on taking a fairly granular look at each of Elden Ring's various systems, going into depth on what they are and how they work. But as I was piecing it all together, I started feeling like something was off, as if the video really didn't make any sense. And I think it just comes down to the fact that Elden Ring, to me, isn't the sort of game that needs to be dissected in this way, because the individual parts aren't really anything special in and of themselves. It's the coming together of it all that makes the game really shine. And boy, does it shine. To put it right out at the front, I think Elden Ring is a fantastic game. It's like they took the formula that made the Souls series so popular and multiplied its scale many times over. In fact, to me, it's almost exactly like that, as if Elden Ring is just multiple Souls games combined into one. I don't want to oversell it here, but... I am already fairly confident this will be one of my favorite games of 2022, and it may possibly even end up as one of my all-time favorite Souls games. Now that said, any pre-release review or coverage of Elden Ring will be somewhat lacking. The nature of the review process means we only get so much time with the game, and frankly, more often than not, it just isn't enough. And I think that's even more so the case here with a game like this. One thing that prior Souls titles have made very clear is that you can speed through things for sure, but there's also miles of depth to uncover should you go looking. And having spent the past week with this game, it's obvious it's going to be no different. People will still be figuring out new things about Elden Ring months and even years down the road. So Duh, a review made after one week of playing isn't quite going to cover at all. I have spent enough time with the game to have an opinion, but not enough just yet to say where it's going to stack up in the long run. What I can say though is that this is clearly a really good game, and you are probably going to want to play it, even if you haven't touched Souls games in the past. If you like action combat, if you like fantasy games and RPGs, if you like open worlds and exploration, there's bound to be something about Elden and ring that you enjoy and yeah i do think you should check it out before we go any further though let's briefly talk spoilers i know this is one of those games that people who intend to play may want to avoid having spoiled the tough part is what someone qualifies as a spoiler varies for some people it's anything related to the narrative for others it may be a boss fight the names of locations, learning about game mechanics, or even just seeing a new type of enemy, so on and so on. It's hard to pin down every possible thing that someone watching this video may consider a spoiler. Now, being a video review, I do intend to both talk about and show some of the game, while also being mindful of and trying not to spoil too much. I will not be talking any specifics about the story, I'll avoid showing any boss fights that haven't already been made public, and I'll try talking about mechanics without giving away too much about how they're discovered, or in some cases even how they function. On top of that, the terms of the Elden Ring review embargo make it so that I can't even show you anything past the first two big zones. While it is a tad strange to be making a review where I can't show you any mid or late game content, I do understand the need for such restrictions here. So much of the wonder and awe that comes from playing a game like Elden Ring is directly tied to discovering new areas, bosses, and systems for the very first time. All of this is to say there's so much that's amazing about this game that I've enjoyed and would love to show you but simply can't, and even if I could, I wouldn't. The good news though is that so much of what makes this game wonderful is encapsulated in those first few hours, so let's talk about and show some of that. One of the main features that sets Elden Ring apart from prior Souls games is the open world. At its core, it's pretty simple. The game is made up of fairly wide open spaces in which you'll find roaming groups of enemies, resources, collectibles, and the occasional item. And then scattered all throughout this space are some major points of interest for you to discover and explore. So sounds pretty much like most open world games, right? However, you know how after a while in a lot of those games, you'll sometimes look at this expanse of landscape and think, oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> this is probably all mostly useless stuff and 
then I've seen more or less what it has to offer. Well, in Elden Ring, even after a full week of playing, I don't get that same sense of blandness while exploring. And I think it's mainly due to the fact that you're pretty much guaranteed to find something interesting, useful, or unique at every landmark. And this is thanks to how the game handles its items and looting. Like other Souls titles, a majority of the weapons and spells in Elden Ring have specific locations, as in they will always be located in one particular spot for everyone who plays the game. And because there are so many items and they're all so unique from one another, it makes that process of finding and learning where they are really enjoyable. I feel like this is a large part of the reason why exploration in Elden Ring's open world has been so much fun. But before we go further with that, let's talk a little bit about that process and what sort of things you'll be coming across. So when you first start playing, your map is completely blank. Emerging from the starting area, you're left with just a few visual breadcrumbs introducing you to the game's systems, like the bonfires known as Lost Grace, gathering materials in the environment for crafting, and the summoning portals that are used for calling in other players. Besides that, the game more or less is completely open. You're able to go almost anywhere right from the start. At first, this will be guided by what you see in the environment. You'll head towards whatever happens to pique your curiosity. Eventually, though, you'll discover your first map fragment, which will fill in a portion of your in-game map with some art depicting the various terrains and points of interest. And this is the case for any of the major significant locations. But what exactly are those? Well, there are numerous points of interest or landmarks scattered all throughout the world, as I mentioned. These include things like catacombs, ruins, towers, churches, dungeons, and so on. But these aren't just your generic fantasy names for types of locations. They're actual like location categories. So first there are the catacombs. These are super contained experiences with more or less one direct path from beginning to end. It's kind of like a mini dungeon. You go in, there'll be a bonfire for you to rest at, and then you'll move throughout these areas, taking out the enemies, occasionally solving some sort of a puzzle, until you reach a lever that unlocks this boss room. You then go into that room, fight the boss, and collect a reward. Now, some of these are larger than others, but for the most part, they are relatively small, and I just love them. In fact, part of what I enjoy so much is their smaller size. You can go in and clear most of the catacombs that I've played in under 30 minutes for a nice reward, and I like that they are super confined as well with these really tight hallways and like traps all throughout. It kind of reminds me a lot actually of many old school dungeon diving RPGs. Now beyond the catacombs, as I mentioned, there are other types of landmarks that will have all sorts of stuff, boss fights, events, puzzles, and other things to discover. You'll come across some magically sealed towers that require you to complete a set of steps to unlock. You'll wander through some ruins, and occasionally, while they might seem fairly benign to start, you'll be descended upon by a massive boss. And you'll even come across churches that have NPCs in them offering some assistance or even items for sale. There are these circular platforms all throughout the game's overworld that will phase you into a special boss fight that give a nice reward. And then in addition to this, we have got the legacy dungeons. These are massive locations, kind of similar in design to what you expect from the more contained Souls games in the past. These are very large labyrinths that are layered and interwoven in a way that makes exploring them uh, about as much fun as fighting enemies within them. When you think of the areas surrounding Firelink Shrine in the original Dark Souls, for example, that is the sort of experience that uh, legacy dungeons try to replicate. While the rest of Elden Ring is made up of big open spaces dotted with landmarks, legacy dungeons feel much more like classic souls, a nod to the game's heritage. You'll have multiple options of how to enter, where you can go, which side bosses to fight, with the ultimate goal of being reaching and defeating a major boss and unlocking access to new powers or even new areas. Legacy dungeons are really the main form of 
progression that you'll be taking through the game with all of the other side activities sort of supporting you along this way and helping to flesh out the world. Uh, this is some of the most impressive content that Elden Ring has to offer. And like I mentioned, it really harkens back to the elements that the Souls series is known for. For all of this stuff, the catacombs, the ruins, churches, towers, and these legacy dungeons, while there are a large number of each of these landmark categories, they're also at the same time all unique and individually crafted so that no two are exactly alike. There will be some similarities between them. So for example, every single catacomb is nearly identical in terms of the boss room that you fight in. And also you unlock it by finding a switch at these identical looking statues. But everything around those base similarities will be unique for each location. But then beyond their layouts, each landmark is also bound to have unique item spawns like I mentioned earlier. So if you want the Spear of Reckoning, which is a completely made up item, but if it did exist, it would always be found in a particular chest at a particular landmark for everyone who plays the game. And what this does in turn is make the whole process of exploring those landmarks and discovering what items they hold really motivating and enjoyable. Every time I come across a new catacomb, I cannot wait to clear it out and find out what item the boss will drop. Or when I'm out in the open world and I see a caravan of skeletons marching behind two behemoths dragging a chest, I'm excited to take out the skeletons, cut down the giants, open the chest, and see what's inside. Because I know for certain it'll be a unique item that I haven't seen before and one that I may want to use. And that motivates me so much to push forward towards each and every location, event, or boss that I find. And I think that is the biggest thing about all of this, about the whole game. The motivation to keep going is just so strong thanks to how the world is designed and item locations are laid out. You know, I focused a lot on the landmarks and the points of interest and the items that you can find within, but I don't want to dismiss the what I would just call more basic open world spaces either. As I said earlier, these wide open areas will be full of various types of enemies. There's gathering materials for you to pick up and use for crafting and the occasional item. And while it all sounds fairly plain, it's also the glue that holds everything together and really fleshes out the entire experience. You'll come across groups of enemies huddled around a fire or guarding some nondescript location. You'll collect some of the various resources needed to craft consumables and throwables that really help in your adventure. And you'll also at times be ambushed by some tough enemy types that you've never seen before. It all really adds to filling out the world, the sense of adventure, and the sense of danger and making it seem like a real place. Reinforcing this is also just how gorgeous everything is. The visual aesthetic of Elden Ring is oddly enough both beautiful and oppressive feeling at the same time. Gorgeous vistas with sweeping hills, dense forests, rugged mountains, and underground caverns, all punctuated by these gothic monolithic structures, castles, bridges, towers, looming in the distance begging to be explored, and everything is further enhanced by the ambience created with a day-night cycle, weather patterns, and some killer background environmental audio and music. I just love it all. And I've lost count of the number of times that I've opened a door or gone down an elevator to enter a new area. I hadn't seen before that made me just go like, T dude, wow, this is so cool. Also, at the same time, can I just say so much of the game's world and its inhabitants are deeply unsettling with peculiar and grotesque enemies around every corner, most of which just seem confused and at times annoyed that I'm bothering them, which I totally get a kick of. Like these, these cr creepy looking NPCs will be going about their business and I just walk up to them, start whacking away and they're like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> And then half the time they turn around and smack me and I die. But yeah, it's just, I don't know. It really feels, it's, it's just a very unique world. And it's something that FromSoft does a really great job of. And this also extends, of course, into the NPCs as well. I really don't want to spoil any of the story for you. But I can say that the game carries the torch of prior Souls titles with lots of interesting characters feeding you cryptic lines of their history and their current motivations. I think listening to NPCs is how half the fun of Souls games in my experience. The other half of the fun though is 
the difficulty and the combat. And in typical Souls fashion, this game is very hard. I spent hours failing on the first major boss. It is just as difficult as you might expect. In fact, it's one of those things where I've just come to realize that even after sinking many, many hours and leveling up my stats and my weapons, one or two mistakes fighting even some of the most basic enemies can result in a quick death. Combat really comes down to predicting and learning your enemy attacks and then taking advantage when they're open. Learning when to properly block and dodge, when to strafe around for a backstab, how to counterattack or cast a spell to interrupt your enemy just before they hit you. One thing I really have always loved about these games and has continued in Elden Ring is that in many ways, it doesn't matter how many hours you've sunk into the game. If you start playing sloppily, you are probably going to die. Leveling up just makes it slightly easier, providing a buffer, but it won't win fights for you due to the high amounts of damage you can take from bad play. At the same time, I've also really enjoyed the options that the game has for avoiding combat uh, much of the time, at least out in the open world. You can stealth around by crouching, which lets you sneak up on and backstab enemies for a high damage opener, or you can just bypass them altogether if you're not up for the fight. Uh, maybe you happen to alert a huge group or some boss out in the open world that you feel like you're not going to be too successful against. Well, you can just call upon your trusty horse to ride away because yes, this game does have a mount. It, it introduces and gives it to you fairly early on and it just provides numerous advantages. Besides moving faster, it gives you access to a double jump, which lets you go to otherwise inaccessible areas. There are also these uh, updrafts that you can launch yourself into, propelling super high into the sky, getting to much, much more inaccessible areas. And you can also attack from the back of your mount, which is an entertaining way to engage in some of the open world combat. All of this is true for that open overworld. However, I should note that the game's system of catacombs and the legacy dungeons will prevent you from mounting up when in those locations, which makes sense as these areas are meant to feel much more akin to the prior Souls games in that you either have to run around on foot or just fight or die. Also, I want to briefly touch on and mention my appreciation for the natural progression that this game has when it comes to approaching difficulty. So yeah, like I said, when you start out, you can pretty much do whatever and things will be fairly tough from the start even in that beginner zone but since you can at any point go to wherever you want on the map for the most part with a few exceptions some areas require keys or some other form of access to gain entry but the way Elden Ring works is that with time you will just naturally level up your character increasing their stats along with upgrading your weapons and learning new spells or summons or weapon arts and just naturally becoming stronger over time. This means, of course, when you circle back to that starting area, things will be a little bit easier. You can take more hits and kill enemies in fewer hits on top of having way more tools at your disposal. And I feel like this is such a better form of difficulty scaling than the use of like strict enemy and area levels or game difficulty levels. It's not like you set a difficulty of easy, medium, or hard. It's that the game has the difficulty that it does and you can approach it in a way that it's really hard or with time you can make it easier in however way you see deem fit, whether it means getting a ton more health or a ton more stamina or upgrading your weapons or learning new spells or any combination of those things. In Elden Ring, just like in other Souls games, you can make your way to some of the hardest content while still being relatively weak or you can spend a bunch of time in the starting areas getting progressively stronger with time until it's no longer difficult and then move on to the next region. And I just really have come to appreciate this form of game design compared to what many other action RPGs tend to do. Elden Ring, like other Souls games, does this really well. But of course, the difference with Elden Ring is that it's bringing this type of difficulty scaling to an open world game. And then also, uh, I should mention in typical Souls fashion, bosses in Elden Ring are just over the top and hugely punishing of 
mistakes, learning their attack patterns and how those change through the various phases of a boss fight is crucial to surviving and defeating the boss. And with one wrong move, it may result in you losing most of your health bar or just dying entirely. And of course, you know, I don't want to spoil too much here, but suffice it to say, if you've played any Souls games in the past, you more or less know what to expect. One funny note I want to add here is that pre-launch I was reading, the developer said it would take uh, a roughly 30 hours to complete this game for anyone competent. <laughs> and I just, at this point, I have to laugh because even after 20 hours of playing, I had only unlocked a single achievement and I still hadn't even beat the first major boss. Now I am beyond that now. For sake of spoilers, I'm not going to show or talk much about it, but yeah, going to take a lot more than uh, 30 hours <laughs> <laughs> for this game, I think for a lot of people, at least if you're like me. If I had to sum everything up, I would say that what I've enjoyed so much about Elden Ring is the sense of adventure that it delivers. This really feels like a fully realized world that is just chock full of people with their own motivations and places with a history to be uncovered. It's been just plain entertaining spending time in Elden Ring, and every time I sit down to play, there just has yet to be a moment where I was bored or felt like things were getting too repetitive. The world is fun to explore, is full of stuff to see and do, combat is challenging and rewarding, and the game is full of so many deep systems that I have no doubt players will be digging into for years to come. I absolutely loved Dark Souls. It will forever go down as one of my favorite gaming experiences. Although as much as I loved that game, its interwoven level design and the sense of scale, there were still numerous occasions where I felt like I was pushing against the boundaries boundaries of the world and what it had to offer. Like there were areas that I wished I could explore but just couldn't. Elden Ring feels like it's lifted the boundaries that that game had. I'm not sure how Elden Ring will hold up in the long run to other Souls games, how replayable it'll be, trying out different builds and weapons, how the PvP scene will compare, but I can tell you from my very first playthrough that it has been nothing short of fantastic. I love this game. 10 out of 10, well done from Soft.